Camera A. Three, two. What's going on, everybody? It's me, Asad Ashmali, back again with another episode of Behind the Grind. The podcast where I sit with cool people doing cool things on a regular basis. People whose grind I admire, people whose story I admire, and people who are just basically challenging the status quo and whatever it is that they're doing. Today's guest is Ahmed Hassan. Ahmed, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So Ahmed is from Daraz. He's the CFO of Daraz Pakistan. And um, previously, I had Imran Salim on the podcast. who spoke very highly of his time at Daraz as well did you work with him when he was there yeah i worked with him uh, my tenure overlapped for a year with him oh okay and uh, it was a great experience mm-hmm. working with him sahi uh, obviously somebody coming into a new organization you know yeah. uh, trying to get the hang of things uh-huh. he was very helpful okay uh, so uh, I I I am very pleased that he's doing really well in Kareem as well. Yeah. Uh, See, so. was there a lot of clashing cuz he's like on the commercial side? Well, I'm sure, I'm guessing not clashing but you guys must be getting along because No, so I think uh, it also depends on uh you know person to person what kind mm-hmm. of relationship uh that you can have with that person. Imran mm-hmm. is a very easy person to work yeah. with. Uh he's super not, sweet. He's super sweet and yeah. he's super helpful as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh and one thing that overall the whole team at daraz is kind of uh you know displays mm-hmm. is that they're very easy to work with they're very reasonable mm-hmm. so it's not like you know maine keh diya to aise hi hoga yeah. it's it doesn't work like that so if you have rational if you have logic mm-hmm. then they listen to you imran was similar to that mm-hmm. uh, and that's why we worked very well together nice okay so so how did you this is actually the premise of the first question how did you end up at daraz Ah, uh, I think fate. I am a strong believer in fate. Okay. Uh, so, I out of nowhere, I was in Middle East. I had mm-hmm. been in Middle East for eight years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got a call one day that you know there is an opportunity at a startup who's moving into a mature phase of the organization, mm-hmm. and they're looking for a CFO for their Pakistan business. Okay, would you be interested? Uh, I at that moment at my previous company I d- during 8 years I'd done eight different roles I was looking after the, the whole of GCC cluster as their CFO and mm-hmm. to be honest I had come to a point where my learning curve was kind of flattening uh, it wasn't as steep as I would have preferred mm-hmm. so the raz was something that excited me okay. uh, but it was still a big decision coming back to pakistan mm-hmm. uh and so it took me a good couple of months to decide okay. i actually visited daraz before uh, you know f- uh, finally deciding Sahi. uh came to pakistan this was during covid time uh, like the covid restrictions were still there so you had okay. to wear masks and all of all yeah, of those yeah. things but when i came here when i met the whole team uh mm-hmm. when i saw the working environment and i saw the opportunity i th- i thought that this is something that i would love to do nice so that's how i ended up at daraz nice. and where were you in where were you working b- in the middle east so i was uh, basically based out of bahrain uh-huh. uh i was working with an american multinational in fmcg industry which mm-hmm. is kimberly clark kc kc the yes. tissues tissues diapers <laughs> and yeah, yeah. you know everything that cleans stuff yeah. yes so uh-huh. uh i worked with uh with them for 8 years okay probably uh my professional personality was kind of cured during that those 8 years and i specifically choose the word cured because i think uh a lot of habits which i had taken from pakistan mm-hmm. uh Uh, they were rectified in a way by working with KC especially on the people side uh, okay. because like communication wise or not communication wise i think it was more to do with how a company takes care of its employees and how for a leader mm-hmm. uh you know people who you working with and who are working for you mm-hmm. uh, take precedence over anything else okay. so i think that's what shaped my professional personality 
a lot mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and like but you say that you know what you had taken from pakistan and pakistan was it the opposite that you the environments you were working at was not people centric that also wasn't part of the code at that time i think it's more to do with people come last okay not first uh and that is something that i had noticed or i grew up with when in my professional life mm-hmm. uh business results came first mm-hmm. uh at kc it was a more of a healthy balance okay. a healthy mix between the two uh, like without people there's no business without people there's no business okay. uh, so it, there's there's an award that kc wins all the time as well which is a great place to work mm-hmm. uh, so that's the kind of culture they focus on yeah um so yeah that that's why i say that you know yeah. that was a very good experience for me nice and i am actually the previous episode we did was with sana khaled and it ended up becoming a very people oriented conversation so i just want to ask you one question in this line um do you feel like your exposure to the work environment in pakistan was because of the larger organization in that sense that people come last or was it a departmental division oriented culture that dictated that i think it's a very cultural thing okay. i think because there is ample talent available in the market hmm and uh, talent switches a lot yeah in in this market as well so i think culturally people in pakistan mm-hmm. uh, think that investing in people is probably not the best return on investment right uh, whereas with kc i've i'd seen people working for 20 plus years uh, right. most of the people who, who work for kc work mm-hmm. very long term yeah uh, and also in the middle east mm-hmm. uh, you know there's a dearth of talent so most of the talent either goes from uh, pakistan india or sri lanka mm-hmm. uh, or there's western talent coming so yeah. local talent uh because of the population size as well uh, mm-hmm. local talents is quite sparse mm-hmm. so that's why the importance on talent retention is quite high over there mm-hmm. as compared to pakistan mm-hmm. uh and i don't i don't necessarily blame blame any single organization i think it's a corporate culture mm-hmm. uh within pakistan versus my experience outside do you think it's changing i think so i okay. think so uh i think a lot of organizations are now focusing on the cultural side of things mm-hmm. about how to develop people uh mm-hmm. and how to invest in the right people okay um, because organizations are starting to realize that that's the most important pillar yeah. uh, for growth yeah okay very interesting interesting so i'm gonna i'm gonna side step into now your current position your current role right so like explain to me what is the cfo of the raz do on a daily basis like what is your life look like because i see cfos as the as the financial controllers yeah are restricting spending that are restricting ad spend <laughs> that yeah. are restricting growth in some way and so help me break this bubble a little bit so actually daraz took 3 months to finalize uh, me as a candidate okay uh, primarily because all my financial background i'm not a chartered accountant yeah I'm by education Yeah. Uh so I'm an MBA by education. Yeah. And Which I saw Lums, right? Uh, I did my undergrad from Lums, MBA from IBA. Okay. Uh so I'm not a typical accountant or financial controller as you uh-huh. might call it. Uh I I'm a more of a business finance person mm-hmm. uh, by experience as well and by personality as well. Mm. So if you mm-hmm. ask me what what's a day like in my life mm-hmm. uh, it's more on solving business problems uh not being a blocker but being an enabler uh, okay. and f- i'd like to give my team an analogy as well right that our role is of a goalkeeper uh in a football team right. so a goalkeeper is there uh, as the last line of defense right but uh, and they're there to help support uh, help and support the team win the match yeah. now if goalkeeper makes an error the cost is huge right and they are like you know funny memes pop up all the time on social media of goalkeeper yeah. howlers so if they're if the goalkeeper's uh, role is not to be you know referee 
Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a difference. Mm. Typical accountant mindset is it's of a, uh, is of a referee. Right. So if I were to put it in a football analogy, mm. uh, that's the difference between my role as the R C F O as mm-hmm. versus a relatively you know traditional C F O. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So, uh, that, that's actually. I'm gonna actually explain that to our finance team. Mm. Stop being goalkeeper. Uh, stop being referees. Yes. Become goalkeepers. So I'm guessing that when you sit with the leadership team, this is more along the lines of that if an idea comes up and there's of course some working, you're you're providing the insights and the data based on market sizes. Yes. Um, but like speak to that a little bit more. Like how would this work with the leadership team? So I think a lot of decision making is around pros and cons right uh, some pros and cons you can quantify some pros and cons you cannot quantify mm-hmm. uh, uh, some benefits are intangible mm-hmm. my focus is primarily on the tangible side of things mm-hmm. and my counterparts can then counter me mm-hmm. uh, by focusing on the intangible side of things so mm-hmm. if a business proposal is on the table mm-hmm. that we are discussing in a normal meeting uh, mm-hmm. or initiative that we want to invest in I would like to see the business case that my team works with the business teams on, uh, like what's going to be the, uh, you know, the return on investment. Mm-hmm. What's going to be the top line that will be driven from this mm-hmm. initiative? What would be the user growth uh, driven from this initiative? Those are the hard numbers, uh, and I love to look at hard numbers. Uh, and then if the numbers don't make sense, if uh, against the company's objectives uh, and KPIs and mm-hmm. the business plans, the numbers are not making sense, then mm-hmm. I would like to put my foot down. Uh, in fact, so much so that the whole leadership team has a joke around me that, you know, I should have paise nahi hai written outside my office <laughs> so that, you know, I don't have to say it all yeah. the time. Uh, but it's not necessarily just a straight no. Uh, I do provide input in terms of uh how else can we do it hmm. because my job as the cfo is not just on the business case side but also looking at the regulatory uh, risk side as well yeah uh and for that you know i can't just say no i have to provide them an alternative yeah, solution as well it. yes uh-huh. so that's where that that's something that becomes tricky mm-hmm. because even if a proposal is really really attractive and if it puts the company at a greater risk, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's uh, taxation risk, whether it's uh, corporate governance risk, risk, then I have to you know, put my foot down and say this is not doable. Mm-hmm. And again, as the leadership team is all, they're all very reasonable people. So mm-hmm. usually it works like that. But what's your risk appetite like then? Because I can imagine Daraz being exposed to a variety of risks. But my, sometimes you have to place your bet on something, right? I would say my risk appetite is pretty low, oh. uh, primarily because you're looking at RF zero all the time, uh, the, bond the, rate gets not, not. <laughs> yeah, approaching zero. I would say, uh, primarily because you know us being the biggest marketplace uh, in the country, huh. uh, we are under the microscope of all the regulatory bodies anyway. Okay, so we are not a small player that that can you know bypass some things Mm -hmm. and get away with it yeah so we have to be very very cognizant of the laws whether there's Mm -hmm. taxation laws whether those are labor laws whether those are you know uh, any other laws corporate governance related Mm -hmm. issues so that's where you know uh, i have the legal team reporting into me as well Mm -hmm. so it helps to gauge what's the risk associated with each and every initiative Mm -hmm. and then we take a collective call Okay. Uh, as to whether it's worth doing that okay. considering the risk that we have okay take it so so now let's use this same uh vein actually of fx risk and political risk pakistan's in a very weird space right we were just talking about this earlier um how are you guys gearing up for like you know driving the business towards sustainability and you know, getting away from the burn model and focusing more on now holding on to money that you've earned. So I think uh, we were, A, we are lucky that we have a shareholder like Alibaba. Yeah. Uh, that is one of the biggest names in the industry. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like, you know, we're running 
month to month to raise yeah. funds. Uh, second part is uh, we actually embarked on this path of sustainability before the crisis hit, uh, okay. economic crisis hit, and it. And I'm not just talking about Pakistani economic crisis. I'm talking about the uh, Ukraine war and yeah. you know uh, private equity just running dry after that because mm -hmm. of the higher interest rates in the global economy. So we actually embarked on this journey before that. Mm. Uh, the idea was that we have to look for sustainable growth. Yeah. So we can't just keep on pumping money. Mm -hmm. uh, E-commerce is a very capital intensive business, uh, marketplaces especially. Yeah. Because if in the first few years, you have to invest in the infrastructure uh, and that infrastructure investment comes at an overhead cost as well. Mm -hmm. And as you grow big in terms of your volume growth, that's when you achieve economies of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so naturally COVID helped us get the scale um, and big, with the, some of the growth hacks we implemented over the last two and a half years, our order growth has uh, significantly increased, right? Mm -hmm. And as a result, we actually have started to optimize and monetize a lot of things. Uh, okay. And so much optimize so- Optimize and monetize. Optimize and monetize. Okay. So optimize, when I say optimize, so there are two aspects to improving your PNL, right? One yeah. is your, you optimize your costs. Yeah. And the other side is on the revenue side. Right? Yeah. So we've actually focused on both sides. Uh, and we, uh, Alhamdulillah, are in a much better financial place. Mm -hmm. uh, we are unit economic positive. Okay. So technically, all the growth that comes from here on in is actually incremental dollars. So it's not, we are not burning to bring in growth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the growth, growth will fuel uh, additional investments. Mm. So that's where we are at. Okay. So it's interesting to hear that you're unit economic positive. And do you feel like when, um, with COVID, especially right the challenges that must have happened in the logistics space would have been like ridiculous right how long did it take you guys to offset the, those challenges and the backlogs and, and all of that because i hear um i follow the new i like the, the, a lot of podcasts that i hear especially in the u.s that that talk about um the ports in mm -hmm. la and uh you know east and on the east coast are all like clogged up right there are still consignments pending from china i think um there was this, this health company that was making treadmills. I forgot the name of it, but innovative treadmills. They had to cancel orders and pass them back onto the client and refund money as well. But for you, how did you tackle all of that? Because if that fueled your growth, it had to be at an expense as well. Actually, A, I wasn't here during okay. that peak COVID period. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do know that we have two aspects to our uh, mm -hmm. business model. One is primarily local driven. Mm -hmm. uh, so 95% of our business mm -hmm. is driven by local sellers. We have mm -hmm. close to 100,000 sellers on our platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and so th there's a very small chunk which is imported okay. uh, cross border sellers. So we weren't impacted that much from the international uh, mm -hmm. supply chain challenges. Mm -hmm. We were definitely impacted by local supply chain challenges. Uh, for example, you know, we had uh, you know, those shutdowns mm -hmm. uh, where everything was just un uh, closed completely, not just here, everywhere in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the world. And I think at that time, uh, we had to work with the government uh, and the local authorities mm -hmm. to designate the RAS as essential service provider. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember seeing this. Yeah. Yes. So that that kind of helped us because when you don't have anything else available, all the shops are closed, all the markets are closed. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes even more sense for mm -hmm. you to allow the e-commerce players mm -hmm. like the RAS to mm -hmm. actually do door-to-door -door delivery. Mm -hmm. So from a local logistics standpoint, there was a small break, mm -hmm. uh, but then we recovered very quickly. Mm -hmm. So it was, didn't come at an incremental cost. Okay. Uh, from an international standpoint, uh, we didn't experience too much of a backlog anyway because our business contribution is very, very small. small. But when you say incremental cost, what do you mean? Like it's a large chunk that's amortized or do you mean that it's month over month it will keep increasing because of the situation? 
uh like is it a big sunk cost the uh, uh, physical infrastructure investment you're yeah, talking yeah. about and also what you just said right now like the 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 kinks with whatever was happening during covid mm. wasn't an incremental cost mm. so just could you just define that so this is the, so the cost associated with deliveries is pretty much the same cost that you will have covid or non covid okay. uh, times right uh, it's about getting the parcel from the seller mm-hmm. first mile line haul last mm-hmm. mile delivery uh, so that cost remains pretty much the same mm-hmm. uh, whether you're doing it during pandemic or mm-hmm. after pandemic obviously there is small marginal cost associated with ensuring the health and safety of the riders mm-hmm. and the drivers and all of those things but that's in comparison to the fuel cost in comparison to all other uh, mm-hmm. major costs mm-hmm. that is pretty much negligible okay. uh, so the infrastructure investment is actually uh, amortized uh, over mm-hmm. the lifetime of the asset okay. that we're doing so yeah. so now when you're at this stage that right, when you when you hit unit economic positive would mean break even no yeah, we are positive positive uh, yeah okay. not just break even so yeah. now you have basically you have you have money yeah. basically that you can spend on yeah. your own right? the more we sell the more the more we, you earn yeah. so now does that mean that you are being um you, you as a operator now does that mean that you would hold on to that excess cash or would you decide no, to invest no so we are still investing there? so when i say unit economics positive it it means on the business transaction level we are unit economics positive okay. uh, but obviously we have a huge uh, you know staff le- uh, staff base mm-hmm. we are still investing in our marketing cost mm-hmm. uh, user acquisition mm-hmm. all of those costs are still there yeah. uh, so we are still uh, investing in pakistan alibaba has invested over the past 3 years 100 million dollars plus yeah into pakistan right uh-huh. so and over the next couple of years we are still expecting to invest further in pakistan uh, okay and that just does not involve uh, marketing investment i'm talking about physical expansion and now we are available in 20 cities mm-hmm. through our own logistics network which we call dex Mm-hmm. so we are delivering in 20 cities ourselves mm-hmm. uh and we have close to 90 facilities span pakistan mm-hmm. uh, so that's the scale we want to increase that scale or uh, mm-hmm. and that's where the investment goes okay all right so this is where my mind is buzzing sorry mm-hmm. so don't mind me in trying to phrase this question because you 3 to 5 years you're saying that you can still see some investments happening into mm. Pakistan you seem to be right now the business seems to be going long in this country as mm. well how does your mind try to connect all these different dots because you also mentioned i picked up on that you said in like before we hit this crisis you were already working on a sustainability plan ukraine you mentioned as well and i know that there's some individuals very close to me also like my brother he works in asset management he hears that you know scotland may uh tufan aa gaya to be insurance rates are going to go up and you know something's going to happen over there and then how is it going to connect to his business and asset management what are you looking at like to to actually make better informed decisions what are those five or four factors that you consistently keep your eyes open for when doing business i think one is the first thing is the market and the organic growth potential in the market uh before you invest anywhere uh we have a huge population hmm. uh and that huge population is becoming more and more tech savvy mm-hmm. uh, our e-commerce penetration of our overall retail market is 2 to 3% depending on different uh, you know sources mm-hmm. so within the retail universe india is 10% for example e-commerce right. as a percentage of retail so organic growth potential within e-commerce uh is quite huge in pakistan so if the market is there uh, why wouldn't you want to invest yeah uh second part is it has to be there needs to be light at the end of the tunnel right yeah. you can't just not have a business plan hmm. and just keep on investing yeah so there has to be a path uh which shows you certain growth numbers certain you know investments that are required to meet those growth numbers mm-hmm. uh that has to be there mm-hmm. uh, without that you know if somebody comes comes to me tomorrow and says i need a million dollars mm-hmm. to invest in this initiative i would say 
okay tell me why why yeah, and what's what the rationale with the money, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and i genuinely honestly personal on personal level believe that this is a market to invest in right now mm. uh, not many people share my feelings mm. uh, but this is my genuine belief just looking at the fundamentals of the pakistani market because this population is not going away Hmm. the population growth is not going away hmm. whatever you say about us dollar pakistani rupee parity hmm. the consumption patterns over and the lifestyle patterns over the last 30 40 years have changed significantly like i remember when i was a kid you know we used to have one ac in the whole house and, and every, everyone, will sleep in that everyone room. will sleep in that room yeah. right now if you go to even a middle class house you'll see you know five acs whether they're all you know turned on or not that's a separate conversation but, but they have the the spending power to get there the spending power to get there hmm. and it's only going to get better uh, hmm. and i that's why i think it's it's a market to invest in okay but macro wise what are you looking at like i i think that if you're just talking about the tech space and the startup space well however because yeah. you're you you are essentially uh, an aggregator for sellers and yeah. sellers have to sell goods which have macro dependencies so two things one we cannot look at pakistan in isolation yeah uh, so globally inflation is a global phenomena yeah uh, it's not just pakistan specific yeah yeah pakistan is experiencing supply side inflation it's not demand side inflation hmm. just like rest of the world yeah and also linked to that is the very high interest rates globally yeah which has led to shrinking of available capital for investment yeah and when there is a limited capital a highly risky market like pakistan will never attract that yeah. capital yeah so within that macroeconomic uh, environment where does pakistan sit in specifically and where does tech industry in pakistan sit in mm-hmm. so my view is that the inflation rates have started to go down globally okay. uh, us canada australia the peaks have already been touched mm. like 6 months ago they've started coming down because of the high interest rates so what i'm looking at is around mid 2024 is when the interest rates will go back to normal and there will be liquidity in the market even in pakistan that's my second point uh, i'm coming to that i think liquidity will come to pakistan if we have stability and that's the biggest aspect right now the political instability leads to equity risk premiums going through the roof yeah uh, and right now pakistani equity risk premiums are very very high yeah. uh, they are comparable to some of the you know worst economically run countries mm. uh, and i do believe that once elections take place mm. once a new government comes in and there is stability in the market there will be foreign investment coming into pakistan uh, i also believe that you know local investment levels will go up mm. uh it's just a matter of probably 6 to 9 months mm-hmm. uh for local stabilization mm-hmm. and then when the liquidity comes in then for tech startups in the country mm-hmm. that would be the time to raise capital mm-hmm. okay all right i'll take that <laughs> i don't know whether it'll come to pass or not but yeah. uh, that's my reading uh, of the it's situation it's and this is the conversation that i keep hearing mm. but you know you you are the, the like i'm trusting i i i don't try to form my own judgment mm. on this because i'm not the most informed mm. about it but um hearing individuals like yourself mm. and then those around it's like okay if everyone has this shared understanding and a little bit of optimism then it can recover however we don't really like following plans <laughs> and you know like i know that it's a resilient country and you know the governments internationally also and locally re- recognize that they need that stability it's literally just in their hands yeah. but but let me pose a counter question to you mm. why worry about uncontrollables control the controllables 
worry about the controllables yeah. why worry about the uncontrollables yeah. because then it's it's a pit with no end yeah uh, but you know this is where then the socio economic side of things kick in yeah. right um chale don't control the controllables yeah. but then there is a part of you also that's going to be you know somewhat disillusioned from what's happening around you too absolutely that's right? natural yeah and what repercussions can come as a result of that are exponential as well hmm. right um when you said demand side supply side i easily went back to my o level economics class and then also you realize that in times of recession the the uh, drug abuse and alcohol rate goes up but then also theft and crime goes up absolutely and then you have to mitigate all of that so i think that we are already in that state and it's a, it it kind Or of fast creates... approaching it yeah chalo if we're not there then we're getting mm-hmm. there um and you can also see like you know um people that are in our circles i feel like i was actually talking about this earlier with a friend and i feel like there's this mass migration that's happening yeah. in a sense you know you can now actually see when they what they mean by brain drain mm. i'm sure you also have friends yeah, that yeah, left no, the countries course, and yeah. we all think that is natural think ki bhai hum bhi nikal jate hain um but then you one side of it is that wait for 2024 inshallah sab sahi hoga and then you won't have to worry about all these problems the other side of it is that if the plans don't fall in place and if you know it gets worse then you're kind of holding on to a dream that probably won't come to life and you kind of have this a sense of regret maybe for not following what everybody else is doing and trying to get out or trying to figure out a better environment for them to thrive and grow it also depends on your perspective yeah. on life yeah uh, a lot of people thrive in adversity a lot of people i speak to for example yeah think that most of the assets in pakistan are undervalued right now because of this uncertainty hmm i know of people personally people who are actually on a expanding spree right now yeah in pakistan so maybe who who knows mm-hmm. whether they are right or the people who are leaving are right mm-hmm. right now uh-huh. it's anybody's guess yeah uh what what matters more is this this sense of helplessness has to go away. and i think it's our responsibility mm. as you know thought leaders of or people mm. who have the exposure mm. to actually not spread uh, mm-hmm. further you know misery or further helplessness mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. ground facts are there yeah. absolutely yeah uh, but at the same time i'll give you i'll give you one example I've I lived in Middle East and I worked with a lot of Indian people. Yeah. And I never heard them say anything bad about their country. Surprisingly, yeah. I don't yeah. disagree with that, huh? Yeah. And does that mean there are no problems in India? No. Mhm. But they take pride in their country with all the problems that they they have. Mhm. Uh and when I used to sit down with my Pakistani friends and colleagues. Buraiya shuru negativity yeah. it's it's a it's a mindset mm. thing uh you can be positive and be cognizant of all the ground realities yeah but if you become negative then it's mm. a self fulfilling prophecy yeah. yeah 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 you think it's negative then that's why you're bad. leaving yeah. it's going to make it more negative it's going to make it worse mm. so where do you stop it uh so that's why i i really believe that you know you, we should as people as pakistanis try to be a little bit more optimistic about things yeah uh than just being pessimistic that's mm-hmm. my personal belief Every i don't day, disagree it, with yeah. you i don't disagree with you you know it's just that like the the this i, I love how this conversation has changed mm-hmm. now all of a sudden right mm-hmm. um it's i too like with the business that we're doing with what we're doing as mm-hmm. well um can don't control what you can't control mm-hmm. we got to keep shop alive mm-hmm. we've got students to serve the market is there keep doing what you're doing mm-hmm. and figure out how to keep the lights on and ride that that harsh wave for as long as you can mm-hmm. until you can and that's the key to success like eventually that time will come and then you can leverage the high tide and hit a home can run can i i can i 
give you another perspective on this. Yeah. So I believe that people who will survive these tough times, yeah. businesses which will survive these tough times, will be far better for it once good times are here. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can be like hold on to that resilience, yes. keep moving forward because then, yes, it's a it's a home run from yeah. that point on. And it's cyclical. Yeah. Just look at our history as well, right? Hmm. Uh, I am a keen observer or reader of history as well. So mm-hmm. you start from 47 or you start from 71. 71 or you start from 90s. It's always like this. Yeah. It's always, you know, one cycle of boom and one cycle of bust. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people always leave when it's under the bust cycle. Yeah. But people who are smart, who are thinking long term, that's when they go deep into it. That's when they go deep into it and that's when they actually make money. Yeah. And what I was getting at was that those individuals, now it's, it's a matter of also how much capital you have. Yeah. True. It, that's And this is what I mean, right? Like, I don't have the capital. So I will also still have that mm. that negative sentiment as mm. well. Yeah, like how much longer, yeah, you know? Um, it's also easier for me. I, I do realize it's also easier for me to sit here and talk about... Mm expansion site when people are struggling to make ends meet yeah uh, to pay uh, to pay their utility bills mm-hmm. i understand all of that uh, but then i also understand uh, that i was just coming f- from my office in dolman coming here sea view is full right now mm. and those are not people who are you know going to five star restaurants those are normal people who are feeling who who are feeling the pinch but they're still out there hmm. they've spent money yeah coming to see you yeah uh, with their families and it's not changed versus last year hmm. or the year before so i've been here two years hmm. so i also realized the inflation rates have gone up yeah but also at the same time i you know, my father used to, my mother used to tell me that my father's salary back in 71 was 40 rupees something. And she said, within those 40 rupees, we used to, you know, manage quite easily. And now even a government servant salary has gone up to 70, 80,000 rupees. Yeah. Um, and inflation has gone up as well. So people are spending money, mm. but people are also cribbing about it, which is fair. But if you're running a business, especially in mm. this market, it's not like people have stopped money, uh, mm. spending money. Mm-hmm. Uh, that spend level is still there. So in your opinion now, if you were to, let's assume you're not the Daraz CFO. Let's assume that you, you're doing whatever, or you had some, you had some cash lying idle. Which areas or which sectors would you invest that money in at this point in time? Right now in Pakistan? In Pakistan. If I can find a viable business mm-hmm. uh, in distress, yeah, I would buy it at a very low price, mm. right? And try to turn it around and spin it off. Mm-hmm. If I can't, mm-hmm. naturally I would put it in, uh, in a mutual fund against government bonds. Mm. And then you will track the market to see once the market starts to pick up, you will take out the money, which is giving you 22% risk free. Put it over there. Put it over there. Mm. Uh, Because right now, real estate, A, fundamentally, I disagree with investing in real estate. Thank you for saying that. It's a a non-productive asset. It doesn't add value to Mm. the economy or to your uh, wealth. I hate uh, the argument for it, but that's yeah, another conversation. Yeah. <laughs> all of us have been there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all of us have been there, but the more years pass by, the more I realize how bad it is for the economy. Yeah. yeah. That most of the capital is parked in real estate in Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so definitely not a real estate. I do believe that a real physical businesses, and that's before this started you know you and i were having a catch-up uh, about what you're doing over here and i love it and i think that's where the opportunity is mm. uh, because right now nobody is investing in these things mm-hmm. and there is a market there yeah 
so people two twenty million people will not just vanish one day. Yeah. All of them will not uh, go to Europe or Canada or yeah. US. Most of them are staying yeah. here. They have needs, mm -hmm. and those needs they are they are they these are changing needs. Yeah. With the more digital economy, and those changing needs need to be met. Yeah. And right now there are a lot of opportunities mm. for that. And what you're doing over here is you know one good example of mm -hmm. that. Okay. So essentially, what you're saying is what I'm trying to get out is that, regard if you were to invest in actual tangible businesses other than the the mutual fund to stock management, yeah. it would basically be roti kapra makan. Focus on the core needs and then around needs of people as well. Because we're if we're doing education, that's also two twenty million people also need to be educated in some yes. capacity. Yes. People need to be fed. Yes. Um. People will need mobility. Absolutely. Right. And people need yeah. clothes on their back. Yeah. I don't know if that's what you were saying, but that's what I, I heard. I personally believe it's not just roti kapra makan. Yeah, uh, roti kapra makan is you know Maslow's theory of needs. Yeah, it's yeah. it's very very basic. Uh -huh. I I do think for digital economy the needs are changing. Okay. Uh, within digital economy, you know, uh, there are multiple avenues where. There are business opportunities available. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you just don't have to be a marketplace. Yeah. Uh, you just don't have to be. Uh, why can't you open up a fully digitalized, uh, completely integrated app, and open up a physical hotel in northern areas in Pakistan? Mm -hmm. Right now, there is a disconnect. You have physical businesses that aren't connected digitally. That are not connected digitally, yeah. and then you have digital businesses. Which don't have any physical uh, presence, mm -hmm. so there is ample room for businesses, mm -hmm. normal businesses, yeah. to come up, which provide end-to-end -end solution in for the digital age. Mm -hmm. That's something that is completely missing. Okay. Say. So, and you. Can I have a question which I'll ask you off camera. Okay. So, um, but you were saying something. Sorry. No, I'm saying that this does not necessarily uh, have to be just you know roti kapra makan. This could be mm -hmm. you pick up any normal business. You pick up a kiryana store. Yeah. Uh, you pick up uh, a the retail manufacturing outlet. Uh, mm -hmm. Jeans, for example. Mm -hmm. If you provide end-to-end -end digital experience yeah. to the customer uh, with a physical product. Yeah, completely integrated. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, that's that will be the difference mm. because people want to have that digital experience mm. now. Yeah, all right. So I'm gonna step aside from from this vein. Um, the last leg of this conversation I had thought about was actually uh, ESG compliance and the whole. Uh, what like basically what efforts is Daraz doing when it comes to this? So it's not just uh, me saying this, but uh, over the past few years we have focused quite a lot because we want to minimize our carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, on our carbon footprint, for example, two of our warehouse warehouses we completely you know went solar uh, out of the eight warehouses that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and we eventually want to move completely towards solar. The second thing that we did was on uh, recyclable, uh, recycled material in usage in our packaging. Okay, but uh, the, the the bagging. Yes. Or the, yes. Okay. Uh, the cartons as well, right? Okay. Uh, what we are now, we recently launched a program where you know consumers are encouraged to return their packaging once they receive the parcel. Really? Yes. And we actually want to donate money against that uh, because we want to, you know, a lot of time if something gets delivered to my place, what am I going to do with that package? Yeah. I'm just going to throw it away, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so that's something that we're doing. We have uh, planted trees uh, with uh, the, while working with the government of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So the number of initiatives that we have taken. Uh, and sustainability from a environment standpoint is very core to our 
you know dar- daraz philosophy uh, mm-hmm. uh, have we done everything that we want to do not yet mm. uh, but we've started that journey how do you track it because i'm guessing that i know the psx has a framework for for helping businesses track their uh, esg compliance funds are available around the world so on the funding side mm-hmm. we actually want to unlock that uh, that's why we've started on this journey as well to kind of you know help us uh, mm-hmm. on that front the way we track it is of course through our consumption patterns uh, mm-hmm. the, how much carbon uh, credits have we kind of earned uh, for example when we moved away from normal packaging material to recycled mm-hmm. material now we have that tracker uh, okay. to estimate like you know mm-hmm. what's the impact uh, we also uh, want to make automations more and more uh, throughout our end to end cycle mm-hmm. so that you know uh, the more automation there is the less carbon footprint that you have mm-hmm. uh, that's how it is we actually invested close I I don't know whether I should disclose the amount or not, but millions of dollars mm-hmm. in uh, getting uh, our automated sort centers mm-hmm. uh, into Pakistan. Nice. Okay. Uh, and as a result, you know, you don't have uh, fuel being uh, wasted on uh, parcels erroneously due to manual errors going to one place where they're not supposed to do, mm-hmm. supposed to go. So there are a lot of initiatives. Uh, have we cracked it completely 360 degrees mm-hmm. not yet uh, we want to do more uh, and that's a path that intentionally as a group we have taken mm-hmm. so these are not just the initiatives that are happening in pakistan mm-hmm. uh, we are also looking at uh, bringing e bikes for our riders okay. uh, instead of fuel bikes uh, we are working on a program right now we implemented this in nepal acha yes okay uh, i'm guessing nepal is the smallest is a smaller so it's easier place. to implement yes. these changes so over here we have a big uh, you know uh, dex hero we call them our riders okay so we have a big fleet of heroes uh, and you know it's going to take uh, slow and steady progression to convert them onto e bikes i'm totally imagining a conversation with a kya le hero <laughs> yes <laughs> but um Okay, very no, cool. but they are they are genuinely our uh-huh. heroes. Without them, we are nothing. Uh, without ourselves, we are nothing. We mm-hmm. really believe that, mm-hmm. and yeah. we try to live that as well. Nice, yeah. cool. Okay, so um, this the, the, when you say tracking, and I understand that part, mm-hmm. but exposure to that tracking mm-hmm. is that is that exposure set out publicly? Is that no. something that is in your mandate, or even to your team, like the core team, not just the core team, but then like everyone in the that are under the that are. So payroll. we don't share it publicly. Hmm. Uh, we have internal trackers, uh, which go to relevant people, uh, and they are shared. Uh, but if you ask me, do a does it get shared to the larger audience, the whole employee base? No. Uh, and in future, we do plan to. but not right now we don't share that okay because i would this would be my concern though right mm. is that if it's something that's in the core belief and i understand i respect mm. the fact that of mm. course you can't you can't disclose it immediately but i would like to see a world where um if we can track how much money is being used up in meetings right like shopify i don't know if you saw that shopify made a plug in with google yeah. calendar yes. just to show that yeah. five people in this meeting you wasted this much yeah. this much money yeah it would be the same for our carbon footprint and then also mm. any kind of uh, excess use of our resources mm. and then also savings mm. from that side mm. right because it's it is the the bottom line mm. of things what is your thought on sustainable based investments sustainable sustainable investments or investments made with the uh, with sustainability oriented companies or companies that are working towards climate change in some way i think they are critical Mm-hmm. and the reason why i'm saying that they are critical is primarily with pakistan in mind yeah. you know pakistan is i think the eighth most vulnerable yeah country for uh climate related risk mm-hmm. so it has to happen yeah it is another opportunity uh to another place for the capital yeah. yeah where you can invest and there will be funding uh mm-hmm. there there are a lot of initiatives that are happening globally which can be replicated here in pakistan mm-hmm. uh, uh so 
whether there is appetite within the local market to go towards that i am not too sure mm-hmm. uh, uh, i think internationally there is much more awareness mm-hmm. uh, but the pakistani market is still behind and how would you build that awareness because i know i i speak from my family's experience my mm. brother works with foresight capital mm. he's managing their esg fund mm. um and that level of thinking doesn't exist here whereas even on the stock exchange you have to be esg compliant mm. now they've you know i know picg has all these certifications mm. going out too but there's still no there's still no fund that's oriented around esg or you know i think and i don't mean in, like i mean investment fund would be based on i'll tell you very honestly yeah. i'll tell you very honestly why it's not there mm-hmm. uh if you go to any n- corporate networking event yeah i doubt at least in my experience i have never come across top leaders getting together corporate leaders getting together and talking about esg what can we do uh, and i'm being very transparent here and i don't blame anyone i don't think it's uh, on anybody's top agenda uh, how do you rectify that i think just like you know if when you're trying to convince somebody mm-hmm. you have to prepare a business case yeah and i think there is a business case to be made on esg a financial business case mm-hmm. uh, corporations work on dollar terms yeah. uh, to maximize shareholders uh, profit so it has to be a win win situation for the corporates mm-hmm. and i don't think right now like you mentioned there is an esg fund yeah. i think uh, i don't think there is that uh, I, i am looking for a word i th- i don't think there is a realization mm-hmm. within pakistan that this could unlock real value yeah uh, in terms of money as well and till that time somebody just takes a dive and says i'm going to do this somebody with deep pockets of course uh till that time i think it'll just remain a pipe dream Uh, so somebody has to do it hmm. uh, whoever does it first will reap the rewards okay all right so this is very interesting i have a lot of questions lined up for after this episode but hmm. um so emma i i want to kind of summarize whatever we've spoken about and bring it back to you with your understanding of whatever you've learned over the years your experience right now and your exposure to uh, the tech space and the tech ecosystem in pakistan um i feel like what's happening that many startups that launch right now or any small businesses um are spending a lot of time in trying to build whatever they want to build but i also feel like there is no um there's no standard cheat sheet that they have in front of them of of data to track So in your opinion what do you feel like is the most important or like maybe in your personal experience right now like what are what are the what are the metrics that you track on a daily basis to make instant decisions or to make better decisions Oh we track a lot of metrics but you <laughs> but personally right like per- you as the you yes. as the CFO yes. I'm sure you're not looking at all 100 data points or 150 yes. data points you're looking at maybe like 3 4 so fundamentals So I am looking at from the for gauging the business's health yeah. I'm looking at order numbers customers hmm. uh and top line right yeah how many orders are coming in what's the value of per order mm-hmm. and how many customers are coming on our app that's the fundamental you know uh, indicator yeah of how your business is doing yeah then i am definitely looking at how we're doing on profitability hmm. uh, like if we are are we selling the right things yeah or are we selling wrong things from a profitability angle and then fifth thing i'm looking at so customers orders top line profitability and fifth thing that i'm looking at is cash flow uh because in order for you to run a, a sustainable business cash is really important uh and a lot of people actually 
forget that, especially in the startup space, especially who are actually starting to do a business mm. because they are trying to come up with a pitch for an investor. Yeah. That's not how you start a business. Uh, honestly speaking, I think you start a business mm. when you identify a need, when you identify a market and you try to fix that and uh, and think that, you know, with if I have limited amount of funds, how can I go and crack this market? Mm. You're not there for valuations. You're there to solve a need and to solve a problem. Uh, that's that's what that's how I would put it. And you would only grow if you continue to get rewarded for solving that problem. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, so, what what else do you feel like is it that startups need to really hear right now? I think st stop looking for buyouts and valuations. Fix the business, know your core market, uh, build a sustainable business where you don't actually need a uh, buyout, uh, mm -hmm. where you don't actually need a valuation. Mm -hmm. If you don't run after it, it'll come running after you. Uh, that's how I operate. Uh, and I also believe that this is a tough time, mm -hmm. but if you survive this tough time, maybe, you know, next a year or so, mm -hmm that will be the time if you if you want to get an exit that will be the time to take an exit uh, right now it's about you know doing the grind uh, and uh, surviving okay all right so my last question for you is Amber, that if you could go back in time and you could meet your younger self what would you say to him professionally speaking nothing okay. uh, i would say don't worry about it uh, because like every all the experiences that I've had have shaped me to be the person that I am. So I honestly don't have any regrets on the professional side. Personal side, I would say focus on getting a healthier lifestyle. <laughs> no smoking, healthy food. That's that's my advice. Say. I'm just too far ahead on the road to actually turn back now and yeah. adopt these things. Yeah. This is also a first, Hanan. Yeah. This is also a first, yeah. We tend to do this. So this is yeah. a question that I always look forward yeah. to because one hour into the conversation, the the person's also open up. Yeah. Um, and then Hanan and I always compare notes mm. and this gets in the recording as well. Mm. Um, but thank you so much for your time, Emmett. Thank you this for was having great. me. This was, just, this was genuinely great. I feel like I've learned a lot and um, I also tried getting a better understanding. Mm. So forgive me if there was some naivety in my conversation. No, but no. Uh, I appreciate your patience and uh, your time as well. Thank you. It was a great chat. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Ahmed Hassan, the CFO of Daraz Pakistan. Um, another episode coming out next week. Hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.